Hi everyone, welcome back to 33 Founders. I'm really excited that you're with us today because I'm here with Chris Lexman, the CTO of Rescour. Thanks so much for being with me, Chris. Thanks for having me. Chris, can we start out with you introducing us to the solution you guys have built? Sure. So uh, we built Rescour. Uh, and the idea behind Rescour is that we're helping uh, a huge number of commercial real estate professionals uh, gather, track, and analyze important information. Uh, and this includes things like listings, um, news, sales comparables, employment data, uh, development pipeline, and so on. And we take all of these currently very siloed data sources and we combine them into one unified environment. And with that data, we then take, make buy and sell recommendations uh, using data mining and predictive analytics. Great. So can you give me an example like when we were just chatting before? Let's say I'm looking to get some commercial real estate. I come to Rescour. What's my experience going to be like? So let's say, for example, you're an investor and you have uh, a portfolio. You provided that portfolio of existing properties to uh, Rescour. We take that portfolio and we analyze uh, what exactly about it um, you're actually interested in. So th this means we're trying to figure out uh, through classification analysis, are you interested in properties where the income is high or low? Are you interested in properties where there are high quality schools, low quality schools, somewhere in the middle? And these are, I mean, it sounds a little obvious, like you're like, well, okay, high quality schools and high income, but that's not necessarily everyone's strategy. Uh, there's a lot of investors that will try and invest in a, a class B property, which means that the income might be a little bit lower, and they invest in that property and try and get higher rents over time. So we try to analyze your portfolio, figure out exactly what you like investing in, and then we try to identify other opportunities that are similar. And we do this by looking at, basically by doing what uh, an investment research team would do now. And we basically, through the use of our algorithms, look at all the news in the area, the employment trends, the demographics, um, sales comparables, rent history, and identify which ones of those are similar. So we give you kind of a curated list of uh, exactly the types of properties you'd be interested in buying. And so that's like the where and when to buy, right? Yes. Great. So what do you, would you say right now are the top three challenges that your customers have and how are you solving it? Top three. So it depends on the customer type. Um, one of our, our main customer types is the broker. Uh, their, their challenge is always to find more business, right? So they, right now the market's really strong. Uh, they don't honestly have a problem uh, making a sale. Uh, people want to buy properties. What they want to do is compete against other brokers and get more business. And to do that, um, it's important to them that they're able to uh, talk intelligently about the market that their investors, that their clients are interested in buying in. And so we provide them the tools to be intelligent about that market. They can see, you know, basically a notification stream of all the news that ha happens in the area. They can see when a major employer moves in or when something, uh, a new property is being proposed for development. And um, that allows them to go out and, you know, make a strong pitch to a potential client. Um, for investors... Uh, frequently, some of our best clients are investors who are uh, interested in investing in a new market. And frequently, they wouldn't in the past because they just didn't know about the market. And the idea of having to gain that local knowledge by either being there or hiring someone on in the area that they aren't familiar with was kind of a daunting task. Um, obviously, there have been some successful companies who have done that, but it's a little bit higher of a hurdle than, say, investing in Chicago when you're already in Chicago. So we actually provide those investors the ability to become really familiar with a new market uh, without having to go through that process. And that gives them a much higher level of comfort. And they can even reach out to, um, to brokers, local brokers, that they might not be aware of without having to kind of go through an intermediary. Right. So I know so far the product adoption has been great, especially since you guys got out of your private beta. Once I get on to Rescar, let's say I make my first purchase, how are you going to make me want to come back and use that sure. again for my next real estate? Sure. So, I mean, we, we obviously want the product to be sticky. Um, I think one of the big ways we do that is by providing you uh, a really up-to-date idea of what's going on. 
So, so the news, it, I told you it's the news features that yep. it's the best one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, this is kind of the, the perspective as, of an asset manager, right? So you have an investment group and maybe they have asset managers in house that track those investments and they want to make sure that they continue to, to generate a good return and they want to figure out when the right time is to, to let go of that asset and sell it. Um, so we want to make sure that we are the source for you to get the information to make that decision and even then make that decision for you or at least provide you a recommendation. So we do that by providing you notifications. Like you were saying, if news happens in the area, we provide you with that news. You know, hey, there's a Whole Foods coming here. That's, that's really big news. We can probably increase our rents just because of that alone. Um, or, uh, you know, maybe the employment in the area is, is going downhill. You know, maybe there's been a few corporate relocations that have moved away from the area. So we think you should probably consider uh, starting to think about selling. So there's a few different ways that we kind of make it important that you continue to see what's going on on Rescour. And, you know, these are things that previously they can do on their own. It's just a lot of work. It's too and fragmented take, to do so many different things. It's very fragmented. And I mean, that was one of our big challenges was the fragmentation of all of this data. And so we've built uh, a really robust uh, data pipeline to go and collect all this fragmented and kind of vulcanized information that's in thousands of different places. So when it comes to your customers, this is a lot larger of a sell than say a consumer product because especially corporate real estate is huge. It's a complete business. How do you approach a relationship with the customer instead of approaching it like a transaction of, Hey, I want to sell you on this. Sure. So, I mean that the first place that that kind of makes a difference is, is in how we sell, right? So when we're selling, it's, it's all about building that relationship. It's, it's reaching out to, you know, the first person who's on a team, maybe they're on a research team uh, in an investment office. And frequently, I mean, they love the product, but oftentimes it means we do have to kind of climb the corporate ladder and, and talk to a lot of the different people um, who can make decisions. Uh, and this kind of goes to the extreme at the, at the enterprise level. And we're in talks with several very large brokers that want to roll this out nationally. Um, but because they are very large organizations, frequently there are six or seven different people that you have to get a yes from. And so it's all about building a relationship, uh, meeting with them frequently, talking about how Rescour can grow with their company. And it's one of the main reasons that we actually identified the need for Rescour to be a platform rather than just a data provider. So one of the most compelling pieces to especially brokers is that they can take this uh, massive amount of data that they've collected over time as they've been brokering deals across, you know, depending on the broker, 100 years potentially. Uh, they, they need a place for this. And right now it's, it's generally in um, uh, like an F drive. You know, it's, it's sitting in like a folder somewhere. And it's very difficult to, in commercial real estate, which is obviously location-based, actually find all of that information, uh, especially since research analysts are generally young and they turn over very quickly. So you end up having this knowledge leaving the brokerage firms and, and turning over very quickly. So we're providing them, okay, here's a platform. You can take all that data you have, you can have Rescour geolocate it and show it in context with all of the data that we collect. And so it's, it's really compelling this idea that not only can we use our data, we can actually use their data as well to help make recommendations to them. So when it comes to those meetings, whether it's the first meeting or the last meeting where you're about to close on a new customer, how have you guys learned to adapt your pitch to the audience? So I think the biggest thing um, is it, it really depends on the customer type. Um, like I was saying, the, the broker really cares about the platform. Whereas an investor is a lot more interested in the recommendations we make and tracking their current properties. Um, you know, obviously a broker doesn't really have current properties. Um, but it's really just the idea of, of speaking to the value that we can bring for each customer type. Um, it's obviously different in each case. Um, and I guess part of that is, is just understanding. It's a lot of customer feedback, uh, a lot of talking to our, our beta group, um, our advisors, we have a, a good set of advisors that we've built from uh, commercial real estate companies. Um, we'll frequently have lunch with them or bring them into the office and they'll talk to the whole team about um, 
what they do, their perspective on what's challenging and what they need help with. So it's given us a really good basis to speak directly uh, to the issues they care about. Great. So I want to shift gears for a couple of minutes and talk about your experience at the Launch Festival with working with Jason Calcanis. What was that like, your time in San Francisco? It was great. It was, uh, it was a whirlwind. Um, you know, we spent, we spent a lot of time out there over the course of about a month uh, leading up to uh, the Launch Festival itself. Um, and we spent uh, each week some time with, with Jason and with the launch team uh, tuning the pitch. And um, it was a really great experience to kind of see how much more product focused the pitch was. And I think that that's one of the things that makes um, the pitches that everyone saw on stage and the ones that I was in the audience for as well a lot more compelling. Because it focuses so much more on what does the product do, what's the problem it's solving, and let's see how it solves that problem from the perspective of someone who would care. Uh, versus uh, in a lot of cases, in, in some smaller pitch competitions, you'll see uh, very business-focused pitches. Uh, and, and I think that this was just a lot more compelling. And I, I was really excited to get a lot of really good advice from, from Jason and his team. When it comes to the product in particular, you shared in your Medium post a great insight that you learned from Des Trainer, And I love that graph you showed that when you're thinking of new features, you want to prioritize ones that everyone or most people are going to use all the time. Mm -hmm. How did that impact how you think about your product, especially since you're on the tech side of things? Sure. So uh, it was actually pretty cool. We, we had started talking to Jason, and Jason's actually an investor in the company. Um, we started talking to Jason uh, sometime last year, probably in, I would have to say sometime around September, and he had actually invited us out to uh, his scale conference. Uh, so I actually got to see Des give that talk, which was pretty cool. Des is uh, great. I've had him on the show before. He's really insightful. Yeah, yeah. It was exciting to kind of see his uh, his talk blow up and and be all over the place. Um, I think he's maybe writing a book about it even. Oh wow. Um, that might be wrong, but I thought I saw something along those lines. Uh, but it's it was really impactful for me, and I, I think between between October at scale and, and January, there was a lot of uh, a lot of product focus. And I probably dropped several features just because of that talk and because of the impact it made. Uh, it really drove me to kind of take a look at the metrics, even though we're small and you know with with 25 current customers in our beta group, it's not you know it's not like we're we're Twitter and we can do an A/B test with millions of customers, right? But one it was day. what's up? One, one day, day, yeah. <laughs> it was still very insightful though um, to see. With which features just weren't used at all. And it really allowed us to cut those and put all of our efforts into the features like the news that uh, our customers really love. What is it like to drop a feature? Do, do you just have that feeling of like, what if one day it could be great? A little bit, but it's actually really freeing to drop a feature. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, we put, some, we put a lot of hard work into this, but um, it's not doing anything for us. Let's let's drop this. Let's drop the maintenance we have to do for it, and we can really put our efforts into something that, that matters. Uh, so it's it's kind of freeing, actually, and, and it's one of those things where, you know, it wasn't being used. Yes, maybe it comes back, but if it comes back, it's probably going to be in a in a different in a slightly different way. That's going to be based on good feedback we get. So we're going to build it right the next time. When you guys were on stage at launch, and then you guys later won best B two B award best B2B award, and a lot of people said that you should have won the entire thing, but I know Jason doesn't award the overall winner to anyone right. he's invested in. Ryan from Connect, who won Launch Festival last year, said that you're going to be a billion-dollar company. And I hope in, he's right. In your Medium post, you said it made you walk off the stage cautiously. Why weren't you fist-pumping and walking off? I was doing that, too. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a pretty high bar. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of companies that reach that bar, and it was kind of like, okay, let's let's really uh, start thinking about how we're going to get there, because um, you know that that's kind of the that's the top bar right now. There's others, you know, along the way, and I want to hit all of them. Um, but it really kind of started making me think, okay, this is serious. We really need to get to that point. What are we going to do to get there? I mean, I was kind of walking off stage already thinking through like the roadmap and figuring out what we're going to do next. When, when it comes to that mindset, how did it, so you went to launch, now you said you'd recommend it to everyone. 
Mm -hmm. you got back. How did that change your perspective or the way that you work? Just being at the conference in general? Being at the conference and just like you were saying that when Ryan said that, it really sets that expectation of we want to be a billion dollar company. So now it's not, we have three customers in private beta, now you're ready, you're on the stage. So I think it's it's kind of um, it's kind of the good side of like a self fulfilling prophecy, I guess. You know, you, you hear that and it's like, okay, well, that's what we're supposed to do. So let's do that. Um, and it it really makes you a lot more focused on the the very specific goals that you need to hit to get to that point, um, which is great. You know, because it it gives a much more tangible um, tangible milestone to what you need to do. You know, we need to get to be a billion dollar company. We need our revenues to get to this point. And there are a lot of points between here and there. And there are a lot of things we can do with the product to get us from here to there. And so it, it kind of forces you to break down that really long path, which you can think, okay, well, we're here right now. We've raised, you know, a little over a million dollars. How are we going to be a billion dollar company? Um, it kind of forces you to say, well, someone expects that now. So let's, let's figure out exactly how we're going to do that. Uh, so I think it was it was great. I mean, the the flight home was uh, it was a red eye, but we were up the whole You're time. <laughs> yeah, talking about how how are we going to get to that point? I love that you said that. So you really you end up with that roadmap when someone says something like that, and it really wakes you up. And sometimes I feel like you know you have a team meeting, everyone's gung ho about the roadmap, and then three weeks later, everyone's back into their normal routine. How do you keep that excitement and sense of urgency? I think it's, I mean, there, there, are, there are those milestones. So, so reaching those is, is one of those ways uh, to motivate the team. Um, I think beyond that, though, it's, it's getting feedback from customers and, and hearing that what you're doing is actually providing value to them. Like, it's got to be about, it has to be about what you're doing to actually help your customer. And so we try to get um, as much feedback as we can. So we're building the right thing, but also so that people... Uh, so that the team knows that they're building the right thing and can get excited about being more and more successful. And obviously, if you take that feedback and you incorporate it into your product and build features based on that feedback, you're going to do better and better. And so that kind of keeps the momentum going and keeps the excitement up. What's a feedback cycle like for you guys, especially on the tech side of things? So we we have two week sprints. Um, you know, we spend spend two weeks uh, gathering requirements, talking to customers. Um, more than that, really planning on what we're going to do for each sprint, put that together, and we spend two weeks building it. And during that time, we have, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned that we have a private beta, but we have beyond that even like a core group testing of, group, yeah. of yeah, a testing group. Um, and we get feedback from them frequently throughout that sprint and make sure that we're constantly iterating and making sure that we incorporate their feedback into the product. Is that the fun part of it? Uh, it depends. It can be. <laughs> if you're doing the right things, it's great. Um, sometimes you have to kind of backtrack a little bit, which sucks, but it makes sense. And it, it makes you feel better that you're getting that feedback and going on, on the right direction rather than kind of putting your head in the sand and just going in one direction. When it comes to feedback in general, you guys obviously went to launch and you're working at Tech Square Labs in Atlanta. What's the role that mentorship has played for you in getting, getting you guys to where you are today? I think it's played a really big role. I mean, we, we have mentors across across the range. Uh, you know, Tech Square Labs, uh, Paul Judge and Alan Nance, both very successful entrepreneurs in Atlanta. Uh, they've really kind of changed the mindset about how uh, how people invest in in uh, startups in Atlanta, uh, which is great. I love to see that, especially right next to my alma mater. Um, and you know, Jason has been has been a great uh, advisor for us as well. Um, you know, getting us involved with launch. And like I said, I mean, it's true. We, we did consider not going, uh, which would have been a really bad move. Uh, and he made sure that, you know, we didn't make that mistake. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, beyond that, you know, we have a, a set of advisors that we've pulled from commercial real estate. And they stay super involved. They give us great feedback on, on where we're going and if we're doing the right thing. And I think that it's, it's really great to see you know, not only people making investments, but really caring about the company and staying involved and supporting the founders, supporting the team. So I've been thrilled with our 
advisors. If you had to distill three key takeaways from the last couple of years and what you've learned from them, what would they be? Hmm, three. Okay. I would say, um, say yes as much as you can. Uh, you don't want to miss out on a, a good opportunity. And, and while you might think that there's perfectly good reasons to say no, uh, it, it makes sense to take those risks. I mean, that's a, a big takeaway. Um, I would say commit to something. Make that commitment and don't waver. Um, it's... Uh, if you're going to do something big and something important, you need to make that commitment and you need to show other people need to see that commitment. You know, you're not going to build something big if you're wavering on a commitment that you made uh, in front of potential employees, potential investors, and so on. Uh, as far as a third takeaway, build something of value for some, someone who has a problem. I, I think that that's the most important thing. Uh, and sometimes people lose sight of that. But if you're not building something of value for uh, a big problem, you're, you're not going to be a big company. Great. So as you talk about building something of value, obviously, you guys need a team to support that. And I know you're, one of your primary goals after fundraising is to grow your team. Based mm -hmm. on your Angelist profile, you're looking for software engineers, account execs, development reps for sales, and a marketing director. Are those the positions you guys have right now? Uh, yeah, we're actively looking for all of those. Um, we actually have uh, hired uh, two for the engineering team over the last month, so that's exciting. Um, we're growing. We're about 12 people now, um, 12 full-time. Uh, I have a really strong engineering team I'm excited about. Uh, we're, we're bringing on a VP of sales very soon. Uh, so I'm excited about us, us scaling quickly and, and finding really great people for these roles um, and also uh, you know, expanding the, the data science team is re a really exciting um, goal for us over the next several months. When it comes to engineers, what do you think makes a great engineer? I think a great engineer is curious above almost anything else. Um, a great engineer who's curious is going to go out and find the answer regardless of what the problem is. And you know, if that means learning a new language, if it means using a new tool, that's going to happen. Um, I, I think that it's one of the things I always joke about uh, George Tech being good at is teaching people uh, how to learn. Right? You really learn how to learn. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a biomedical engineer. That's what I went to school for. Um, I spent time, my first three years, um, working at a, a medical device company and kind of gravitated towards um, the machine learning side and helping identify when um, uh, pressure, blood pressure readings would indicate that someone was going to be hospitalized. So, I mean, I, I had no, you know, I, I wasn't a CS major, but I kind of made my way over to that. And I think I was able to do that because I was curious and I, and I was excited about learning new things. So I think that's the number one thing. If I find a, a smart, curious engineer, then I want to hire them. Would you say that that curiosity is pretty embedded in the Rescour culture? Absolutely. Yep. We're always looking for uh, new ideas, new tools to use, um, uh, other data. I mean, we're, we're finding data sets that you might not necessarily think are related to real estate, but they are, and we're, we're able to take our, uh, our data science machine learning algorithms and apply that to those and kind of identify interesting features about them that actually do affect the market. So I think that that requires curiosity. It always comes back to the news feature. It's okay. <laughs> exactly. That, that's the best one. I just read a great post in the first round review where Heidi Rosen shares that you have to leave space for good and random things to happen to you. Mm -hmm. How do you guys do that? Because, like, for example, launch is a good and random thing that happened. Sure. Um, I, guess it's, I guess it's really uh, a level of self-awareness. Um, you don't want to put on the blinders and just go full steam ahead on one thing. Um, I, I think you kind of have to take that meeting or talk to that person who, you know, it's kind of coming out of left field, but who knows what can come out of that. Uh, I think that goes a little bit back to what I was saying on the, on those three key takeaways, which is, you know, say yes more. Um, maybe not all the time, but more. 
uh, I think that you find really interesting opportunities uh, in unexpected places. When it comes to that, it alludes to a post that my friend Mike wrote about startups having a playbook instead of a plan. So mm. know where you're going, but be able to move quickly and change pace if you need to. Right, which is vital for a startup because things will change. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing and it's a bad thing, but I, I yeah. got you. Yeah. Yeah. And when things do change, how do you prepare your culture for that? How do you have a responsive culture? I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's a group of people who um, want to be at a startup. You know, a lot of them in a lot of cases have worked at very large companies where that's unfortunately not the culture anymore. And, you know, on top of being curious, they want to be uh, in a position where things are dynamic and they are changing. And, and so we look for that. You know, when we're hiring, we look for people who are excited about um, the opportunity, even though they don't know exactly what it is, or they may not know exactly what it is. I think it's clear that people are excited about the opportunity. One of the things that Jason said when he presented you guys at the with the award at launch is that you are the leanest startup he's ever seen, and it's about time you start paying yourselves. <laughs> what are some ways you guys have adopted that lean startup mentality? Well, uh, we're fortunate that we're in Atlanta. That helps. Um, the The market is not quite as uh, as high either in real estate or in uh, in engineering as it is in San Francisco. So that definitely allows us to stay leaner. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, I think you know everyone at Rescour holds equity, and, and they're all excited about what that can mean. Uh, especially when when Ryan says that we're going to be a billion dollar company. company. I think that's fist pump now. Yeah, I think it makes it a little bit easier for them to say, okay, I can hold off on, on you know, getting paid a, a market rate for a little bit longer. Um, and, you know, we get office space um, from ATDC, uh, which is a uh, Georgia Tech's incubator that we're a part of. Um, it's, you know, it's cheap. We could, we could get nicer desks. We could get nicer chairs. Um, you know, all of these things could be nicer, but we, we use what they gave us, and, and it, it doesn't really affect, you know, the – the culture, the dynamic portions of our culture, our curiosity, it's, you know, it's just a piece of furniture. All right. So now before we go, let's fast forward and say it's 2018. We're back yeah. at the launch festival and you guys are that billion dollar company. Hopefully so, we're sponsoring it. Hopefully you're sponsoring it. I'll be there fist pumping in the audience. <laughs> what do you want to be telling the audience about rescouring your journey? So if you could write your own headline, what do you want it to be? Well, I think uh, if we're we're sponsoring the launch festival, it would probably be really helpful if we say, uh, you know, Rescour launches at <laughs> launch and becomes billion dollar company. Uh, but I, I think that I want people to know that, um, you know, it's uh, it, it can happen first of all, and you don't have to have come from you know the the perfect situation. It takes a lot of hard work. Um, it, it takes being very open to good opportunities, but that it can happen and that there are, uh, there are things you can do uh, to get yourself to that point. I love it. So how can people stay up to date in the meantime before the 2018 with everything the Rescour team is doing? So um, we will be uh, updating regularly. Uh, we're building a blog right now. Um, I think Medium is, is great, but it's, um, we need something that's a little bit more Rescour. Uh, beyond that, you know, checking our website, but we're going to be, we're actually going to be in uh, San Francisco over the next um, three months or so pretty regularly. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to keep people up to date on what's happening and, and our fundraising and what that picture looks like. Great. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you.